Caller, welcome to the show. You are live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Robert from Austin. Hello, Robert. How y'all doing? Doing good. How are you? Good, good. Hello, Rabbi. How are you? Shalom. Doing very well. Thank you. Yeah, good. Rabbi, I was wondering how the idea of of a hell crept into the Christian mind uh, and, the, and their theology. If Judaism doesn't have that in there, there's no... There's no, like, when you die, you go to hell or you go to heaven and your soul will be judged. I'm wondering where the idea of of there's a place called hell that has fire and brimstone and it's an eternal place of damnation. I'm wondering where that came into their their um, their thought processes on, on where the soul goes after death. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, that is a great question, by the way. So um, go ahead and hang up now. You can tune in for your answer, okay? Okay, thank you, guys. Yeah. I'm surprised it took so long for someone to ever ask a question like this. How did the concept of heaven and hell creep into Judaism? After all, if you look in Tanakh, it would be very hard to find. Gehenna, I'm just using that term because it's, I just need to use conventional language, is a place where typically somebody would go who dies with some sin, and that sin has to be atoned for after a person dies. Now, we find this in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 14, but it's very, very rare that you would find any description of the afterlife in Tanakh. It's there, but you really would have to know where to find it. The resurrection of the dead, it's there. Isaiah 26, verse 19, Daniel 12, verse 2. But it's just, it's scant what happens to your soul after you die. It descends up to heaven after the body is buried. Where? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. It's there, but very rare. In other religions, and I'm talking about Christianity in particular, it's all over the place, on every page, up and down, up and down, heaven, hell. And of course, the threat is that if you don't follow Christianity, you're going to go to hell. If you look in Tanakh, you'll find there's just a scant mention of this. It's there, but it's only inferred from the text. The question is, what is going on here? Now, I want you to listen very carefully. If you are God, and you are writing a Torah, the word Torah means teaching, and you want people to live according to these teachings, that's what the word Torah means. The Torah, therefore, is an instruction manual for mankind. And you want to show that if you follow the Torah, you're going to be blessed in a certain way so that you know how to guide your life. Now, you're God. What would you do? Think about it. Would you say to people, if you don't listen to me, you're going to go to hell? And if you listen to me, you go to heaven? You wouldn't even waste your time with that. Why? Because it's unverifiable and it's unfalsifiable. It's silly. What you would do is exactly what the Torah says. The Torah tells you the following. If you do not follow my way, Hisham l'cha, be careful. If you don't follow my ways, this is what I'm going to do. Remember, you're God. You are not only the creator of the heavens and the earth. You control the heavens and the earth. And therefore, you could say, look, if you sin, I'm going to stop the rains. What effect will that have? The land is not going to give forth its fruit. You're going to starve, and then you're going to be forced to turn back to me. I'm going to send you into exile. You're going to be there for 70 years, but you're going to return then, and I'm going to send you again. Now, if you're not God and you're writing a Bible, you don't want to ever include this kind of stuff. Why? Because you have no control over the rains. You have no control over the seasons. You have no control over the fertility of the land. So therefore, false religions, heaven and hell are all over the place. And think about, let's say you and I decide, you know what, no matter what you do for a living, religion is really where it's at as far as money goes. If we were going to write our own Torah, we were going to write our own fake Bible, what would we do? Well, we can't tell people that if you don't do what we tell you to do, that's going to stop raining because we have no control over the rain. We wouldn't tell people that the land is not going to give forth this fruit because we're just making this stuff up. So what, what would we have to appeal to? We'd have to appeal to something that's unverifiable. Most importantly, we'd have to tell them, if they die, you're going to go to hell if you don't listen to me. If you listen to me, you're going to go to heaven. That's so perfect. Why? Number one, we're addressing man's greatest fear. What happens after you die? This is frightening. Moreover, you can't check it. Like, what are you going to do really? How are you going to test this out? Are you going to go to Home Depot, buy a shovel, go to the nearest cemetery, dig up a grave, open the casket and say, hey, buddy, Harry, what happened? 
<laughs> this is a big cross on your on your coffin. How did it work out? That can't be. That will never happen. When a religious document is just front loaded with heaven and hell, just all over the place, you could be certain this is a man made document. Because if you are God, why would you appeal to that? It's unverifiable. If the book is trying to get you to repent, the book would tell you what's going to happen along the way. An example, people who care about public health, they're going to warn cigarette smokers that not only you're going to almost certainly die a horrendous death, but there'll be a series of events that you're going to suffer, maladies that you're going to endure, coughing, shortness of breath. And these are all indicating that you are in a lot of trouble. And here's the good news. If you quit smoking, in about five years, your body is very likely to completely recover, and you will then have the same statistical health outlook as though you never smoked. That's an amazing thing, and it's verifiable. So if God wrote a Bible, if God writes it, he doesn't have to appeal to heaven, hell, to skip. That's, that's the, the false religions need to do that. The true religion, if it's written by God, God, why would God ever appeal to heaven and hell? Why would he do that when he could just affect the world around us and we would immediately get the idea, oh, I'm out of breath, I have to quit smoking. And anyways, let it be that we should live in a time we should witness I believe we are, that all the nations will come to speak in a pure speech and we'll all come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9 quickly in our time. Thank you so much for your question. Adon Olam Asher Malach 